And I'd been following her for a long time. I, I got to meet her a couple times at King of the Hammers and um, SEMA and Fabtech and things like that. We were always kind of like in the same space. Um, but after she passed away, the day after, I was talking to my brother on the phone. And he was a big fan of her, too. And we were kind of like going back and forth reminiscing about it. Um, and I, I told him, I was like, I kind of want to race King of the Hammers. And he's like, do it. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so I had my samurai ready in five months to oh, raise King of the Hammers. Fasten your seatbelt. All right, everyone, on today's episode, I sit down with Amber Turner, and we get to discuss her experience in the famous Rebel Rally, her quest for a finish in California's desert race, King of Hammers, and uh, basically anything that involves women in the off-road space. Let's get to it. We're finally getting to do this. I know. This took so long. <laughs> I know. It's, imagine, it, it's so funny. Two, two women in like this off-road adventure world, it's weird that our schedules are so crazy. <laughs> Mm, that's that's how life Sh is shocking <laughs> right Do are you, you on the road or where are you are you competing in something or? It, are, am i preparing to compete in something that's how my life is right now yeah so actually that's a lot of your life yeah. <laughs> well, I, well i guess it's a lot compared to mine so maybe we should give some context you just competed we'll just jump right into what you yes. just did okay that competition yes i did just compete um you want to talk about Rebel Rally? Yes, let's talk about it. <laughs> so tell everyone what the Rebel is. Yeah, so it's a all-women's 10-day navigational off-road rally. We're basically driving our vehicles from point A to point B every day. We don't have any GPS. We do everything with a map and a compass. Yeah, it's wild. Um, yeah so we wake up at 5 a.m. and they give us a list of about 20 different coordinates. We have to plot them on a, on a map and then you know, hit them mm -hmm. um, in order, mostly. Um, and like I said, go from point A to point B for 10 straight for 10 days. days. Yeah. Can you um, like briefly describe what like manual navigation is? What does um, it involve? And for the audience, because I know that's because it's I mean, in the age of computers and GPS. OK. I don't think people realize that there is actually a way to figure out where you're, to read a map. Yeah. Completely manually. Yes. Um, I I don't know, man. I'm not that old. <laughs> I, use, I used paper maps when I was a kid. But basically, like, you know, say you want to go from one city to the next. What freeway are you going to take or what highway? What road? You have to look at the map, find the shortest distance from point A to point B. Right. And figure out how to get there. But you're using a compass, I think. That's yes. that's a unique element to the mapping. Yeah, so the Rebel Rally mapping, um, like I said, they give you a lot long, a lot of two longitude, plot it. And then um, one thing they teach us in training for Rebel Rally was that heading and distance don't lie. So you take a heading, which is, you know, if you're looking at a compass, you have so many degrees off of north. You know, it's a 360 degree circle, so many degrees off of north and then a distance, and you follow that in a straight line, which is, like, easy on paper. It's easy to draw a straight line on paper, right? Um, but, you know, if you're looking a kilometer away, because everything in the Rebel Rally is in metric, which is... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. it's really nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're looking a kilometer away, there's going to be trees in the way, there's going to be bushes, there's going to be a hill, right. you know? So you kind of have to um, say, all right, I'm going to go to here and then back um, navigate. There's another word for it. I can't remember. Um, and make sure I'm in the right spot and still going in a straight line. Okay. Because I don't know if you've ever tried to do it, but like... No, just, I haven't. This terrifies me. Well, this I'm, is the part of the rebel that I'm like, I don't know about that part. <laughs> yeah, no, not even just that part, but just like even looking at a map on it, on your GPS, if you're like off-road and you uh, don't have a tr like a track that you're following, you just get completely turned around. Yeah. Like, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's north. Nope, that way is north. <laughs> it's amazing how, if it's not a daily thing for you, I think it's amazing how, how confused it, you can become. Yeah. Like, I got completely turned around on day two and this was actually one of my proudest moments like i was in a spot where i saw a power line on the map i saw a power line road on the map i saw mine on the map and that's where we were and then i was like wait but north isn't that way 
<laughs> so I turned it back around because we're I thought we were was going to be a checkpoint and there ah. wasn't any checkpoint there. OK, so I found north, looked all over the map, found another spot that looked just like where I thought we were. And I was like, all right, we must be right there. And so the scoring in Rebel Rally is you get a um, GPS uh, tracker. Mm -hmm. And so you hit the tracker when you get to a checkpoint and it will tell you your lat long. You get penalized for using it when you're not at a checkpoint. Okay. Um, so I basically took took the lat long, plotted it, and figured out, yeah, we're exactly where I actually think we are. <laughs> okay. So, so you had some way to confirm so you're not completely lost. Yes. There are ways <laughs> to get yourself unlost. They oh. highly recommend you get yourself unlost before calling them on the sound. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a beautiful part of the rebel as you come out, having not only learned a skill, but having to use it. For 10 days. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a, a great way to solidify something in your mind. Now, I don't know if how long you retain that, but hopefully it's yeah. something you can kind of lean on. <laughs> I, it came pretty natural to me as far as like plotting the points because it's basically taking squares on a map and making them into smaller squares. Mm -hmm. So it's the same as reading a tape measure. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's a... what I do every day. So it's that part was super easy. And then I, I look at maps all the time when I'm off road, you know, just my GPS right. on Gaia or something like that. Um, and it's just kind of, like you said, solidified the whole concept of like, if you look at this, what does that look like on the map? You know, yeah. where are you in relationship to that kind of a thing? It made it give you real life experience with it. That's, yeah. that's, but they do train you for that. That is a yes. part of the, in the, the prep for this competition. Is it mandatory training that all those those classes you guys go? Okay, none so of the it's... none of the training is mandatory. Some of it's um you have to pay for, and some of it's free. Okay, so but they uh, do offer a lot of classes. I, I'm pretty sure they offer online classes too, where you just go into a Zoom meeting, um and yeah, they they prepare you for everything. That was one of the things that impressed me the most about Rebel Rally was how well organized it was. Mm. Um, they basically. Literally on the last day, they roll out the red carpet, but like the whole competition, I just felt like everything was laid out for me perfectly. Awesome. It was really nice. And and I know we said this before, it's a female only competition. Um, who did you, and, and I know you had a partner, so, and I know who your partner was, but <laughs> tell everyone who your partner was. It was my mom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. This was actually all her idea. Like I, you know, Rebel Rally had been on my radar for a long time. Mm -hmm. But um, last year, um, what is it, like, um, signups opened for Rebel Rally while we were at Trail Hero, and she was like, you know what, screw it, we're doing it, and signed us up right then and there. And so the whole last year, I made it a priority to try to get ready for this, um, and I did. <laughs> Not as much as I would have liked to, but... <laughs> um, yeah, it, this was her whole thing four years ago. She bought this little Suzy Via Cross thinking, I'm going to compete in Rebella Rally in this one day. So you're, I love that your mom has this story. It's just not, it's not one we hear very often. And it's, I, I love it. Well, maybe I just don't talk to enough people. I'm not sure. But the first time we met last year, you were with your mom. And I ignorantly just did, didn't realize the connection between your mom and, and you and this off-road sport that you guys participate in yeah. but she's very active in this extremely i'm so lucky that both of my parents and the rest of my family and this is like a huge family affair for all of us and my mom is so involved and everybody that i deal with loves her <laughs> that's awesome yeah so is she kind of part of your origin story as far as getting into your love of all things off-road or she definitely contributed just um like when i was a little kid how my family kind of got started in off-roading and outdoorsy kind of stuff is my dad was always into dirt bikes. He liked dirt bike okay. riding. So we'd go to the Southern California desert to take my dad and my brother's dirt bike riding. And our whole family rule was that if we went on a trip, everyone went. So, you know, I'd go along, my sister would go along, me and my sister and my mom would hang out in camp. Gotcha. <laughs> so that, I mean, from that to... um you know, our first time at King of the Hammers in 2014, mm. um, that was a huge, that was, all of us went to that as well. And we were only there for three days and we were absolutely hooked. Mm. So. So with that, I don't want to, because I, I, oh gosh, I want to finish the rebel, but I, I want to talk about King of Hammers too. So was that, was that kind of your initial first competitive experience with? 
Not. <laughs> well, you know what? 2014. That might have been my first competitive experience with off-road. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Man, you jumped in the deep end. Still king of hammers. Um, well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but back to the rebel. So I know you said it was 10 days. Um, and every day you guys are given a different, you know, you're mo- you move from We from started Nevada. in Lake Tahoe this year. Oh, in, okay, in Tahoe. Yeah, it, it cha- the starting place changes every year. So mm-hmm. we started in Incline Village and we ended up in Glamis. Okay. It being 10 days. I mean, I, obviously we know a lot can happen. So for the audience, did you guys complete the 10 days? Yes. Okay. That was our one goal was to finish, and we finished. And, and where did you finish in the competitive lineup? Really low. <laughs> I can't even you tell finished, you. Finished though. Yeah. Honestly, I think in any time. I mean, not just this race, but like any time. Those the a rally style. It really is just to finish. Yeah, I mean that's Never always wants to place, but yeah. Sure. Well, that's that's the thing. They they set you up for it in training. You know, they tell you. There's a lot of women that come in with a lot of really high expectations for that event, Mm -hmm. and they have to knock you straight down. Like, you cannot place well in Rebel Rally if you haven't done it for at least three years. That's just how it is, because they're seven years into the competition, and the women that are on the podium know what they're doing. Right. You can't just come into this and place. Like, they do have other awards. Like, there's the Spirit Award for helping out your fellow Mm -hmm. team or, you know, competitors. Um... Small stuff like that. Because sometimes you're coming across a disabled or uh, a vehicle that's gotten stuck. And yeah. do you, do you, does everyone help or do you just have to choose to help? How competitive is it? Um, <laughs> Like, would you just blow by somebody who's like, I, I want to win this thing? Honestly, I can't speak for the more competitive teams. I feel like they're so far out in front of okay. the rest of us okay. that they probably just blow past. But um, it's a really good community and it's just like most of off-road where if you see someone that's stuck in the sand or the mud or something, you're going to pull over and help them out. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how Rebel Rally is. It was like a big family at the end. Awesome. So so the real question is, would you do it again? I would. Definitely not next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm down to, for doing that competition again. I would hit it much harder than I did this year. Okay. Because I'm really competitive. And that was one of the off-putting things for me was I didn't do very well. <laughs> So um, I'm down for doing it again. Um, it was a great experience. Okay. Um, but like I tell everybody, it wasn't really my cup of tea. I, you know, I came off for Bell Rally and I was fully ready for King of the Hammers prep. <laughs> okay. So so you like a little bit higher octane um, yes. experience. I'm well, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different community too Mm -hmm. like i loved the rebel rally um like how all the women were from different walks of life and all that kind of stuff it was it was really really diverse um but you know king the hammers just my people yeah you know the from the first time i went down to that event it's like this is where i belong Mm -hmm. so and that's i think that's a there are there are differences within the off-road community obviously we know that but um (laughs) The competitive rally scene is very different. I mean, that's different from overlanding and that's different from just, you know, exploring dirt roads and, and just kind of adventuring with your off-road vehicle. And then there's the the crawling and then there's like the extreme off-road and then there's a speed desert off. You know, I mean, there's yeah. there's all these different. And I think it's we like to kind of team up. It makes us feel good. You know, you got your you, you got your name for what we do. And sometimes there's some I don't know, I feel like there's like competition within the space. Well, just within oh. like the, I guess when I first started, I'll back up and give a story on this one. Okay. I remember the, uh, there was, and I think it was social media induced that created it, but there was a lot of like back and forth between, and these are generalizations for sure, but like the crawler community versus the overlanders. And I I kind of came in and like the, the, the buildup of it. And I was so green that I was like, I barely found out I can go off road just a little while ago. Like I don't, so I d- it didn't quite make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I was so ena- I was so enamored with the crawlers. Like I just thought that was like the, the coolest thing ever. So when you would hear like the beef back and forth between the two parties, I was always like, I don't get it. Like what I would, I don't know if I could do that, but I'll watch that all day. <laughs> yes. Um, because I mean, let's let's be honest. There's definitely some skill involved. There's experience that's required for crawling, and there's a very specific build um, if you want to do it extreme. 
<laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's, let's talk it, about it. I mean, it all depends. Like, I this is one thing that I really impresses me. Um, you know, I work for Randy Slauson at Bomber Fabrication. He's won King of the Hammers three times. The world's won it, hardest one day off road race three times. And he drives a completely stock Toyota Tacoma through Rubicon and back. We probably did it four times last year. How did I not know this? <laughs> it, you know what? And like, you know, I started in a Suzuki Samurai. Yes. It's, you can go out and do these things. You don't necessarily need all these expensive parts and these huge builds and stuff. Yeah, it makes stuff a hell of a lot more comfortable. <laughs> but if you want to get out there and do it, just do it. Well, there you go. I, that, we're done. We're just going to wrap it up right <laughs> there. She's done. Everyone knows. <laughs> that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so... And I guess you're correct. I, I totally stand corrected because your your vehicle that you kind of, I mean, at least you came on the scene in my, from my perspective, which is very limited, um, was the Suzuki Samurai. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing more badass than seeing you out in the California desert in that, that rig. And it has made me, res watching what you were able to do with that vehicle, um, specifically uh, in the King of the Hammers, at least in that terrain was impressive and i think it did give it was like oh i don't understand this sport at like i need to be exposed more to this sport i have i don't know everything for sure because i'd kind of locked in some preconceived ideas of what what it would look like if you did this and it's like you kind of broke the mold on that at least in my eyes no, one being female and two i just had never seen a samurai out there now i know you're not the first one out there i am aware that that is a that samurais get out there and do amazing oh. things off road i was the first samurai to Run were you stock at class? Yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I think I was. I I want to say I have the smallest tire, or I used to have the smallest tires that I've ever run to back when I ran thirty ones. Really? Because the max tire size in the Everyman Challenge is thirty sevens. The max tire size in my class is thirty fives. Okay. And so, and I know the side by sides run smaller tires, but they're on a different day. <laughs> <laughs> that's not your competition. <laughs> that's not my competition. No, those guys go way faster. Yeah. <laughs> those are all. That's a. That's almost a toy, man. Those things are amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, so should we give some backstory on King of the Hammers? Yes. Yeah, okay. we definitely should. I'll just let you talk because you probably know way more about the history than that. Yes. So the first King of the Hammers started as a competition between friends in Johnson Valley, the Southern California Desert, in 2007, I believe, is the first year. Okay. Um, I think they had 12 competitors, 12 or 13. And... Basically, if you can imagine Johnson Valley, it's a big dry lake bed in the middle surrounded by these incredible mountain ranges. And there's these valleys up between every single mountain that are prime rock crawling. Like they are the perfect rocks for vehicles to climb over. And so King of the Hammers was basically like um, you're going to go run a desert lap, which is Johnson Valley itself is like 30,000 acres or something like right. that. It's massive. So you go and run the desert lap, and then you go and run a couple rock trails. And it's whoever can do it the fastest. Run a couple rock trails. You're, you're <laughs> driving up a waterfall. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, like, these guys back in the day were doing that kind of stuff. Like, they'd go out. Um, the guys that founded the event, they would go out on the weekends and be like, how many rock trails are we going to run today? Yeah. Like, how can we do this as fast and gnarly as possible? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that spirit has continued because it is – if you haven't been to King of the Hammers, I it's it's a once in a lifetime experience. I think uh, <laughs> off camera we were talking. Um, it's kind of like Burning Man for the off road. Exactly, <laughs> has that been used before? Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's the, uh, probably one of the best ways to put it. It is the Burning Man of off road. It, it's unbelievable. There's eighty thousand people that come onto the lake bed for one week out of the year. It's a, it's. You just have to go and experience. Like, there is no way to describe it or to really convey what you're going to experience. I mean, it's a, there's a little bit of fear involved, especially late <laughs> at night. <laughs> because it's, it's I don't want to say it's a free-for-all. Because it's amazing that everyone kind of plays nice together. But it is a bit of a free-for-all. It's open desert. Yep. It's all BLM land. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have the freedom to kind of camp anywhere. Mm -hmm. And people do. So there's all these little, like, makeshift communities that have popped up all over. Plus there's Hammertown, which yep. is its own ecosystem. <laughs> um, and it's not just that. It's like we have the vendor area in Hammertown. We have all the garage spaces in Hammertown. Yeah. And all the infrastructure that actually goes into just building Hammertown every year takes, like, one month before and one month after. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And it's incredible when you look at the event with 80,000 people on the lake bed and Hammertown all set up 
And then after they're done taking it down, you can't even tell it was yeah. over there. And I think, and that the fact that it's done in California and it's allowed to continue shows how good they keep that place clean. Oh yeah, because California is looking for an excuse to shut down anything, right? We yeah. know that. Um, but I also think it really helps that so much of King of the Hammers is still um, like local community based. Yes, these are people that. They don't just come out for King of the Hammers. This is their backyard. That they, yep. they play here, they train here. Um, like, so this is home to them. So you don't mess with this area. Yeah. We protect this. And not just that, King of the Hammers also has. You know, they can show at the end of the year we brought this much money into the community, mm. and that's, um, you know, part of the reason why a couple years ago the military base that's right next to Johnson Valley was mm -hmm. going to take over Johnson Valley. Oh, I didn't. I almost accidentally drove through there. That was. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no, that's I've heard really bad. But anyways, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> but so uh, King of the Hammers came in and um, saved the, you know, made this whole Save the Hammers campaign and Save the Hammers essentially because they could prove that it's such a profitable event that it needs to stay. Got it. Because there's not a whole lot of other money coming into that area. Yeah, you know, it's good for the, the community as a whole. Yeah. So back to the competing in King of Hammers. Now, how many years? You've been doing that for a couple years now. 2020 was my first, so this year will be my fourth. Okay. Yeah. And are, what um, what grouping are you in for that? Stock class. Okay. 4,600 is the number designation. Um, we're allowed to have maximum 35-inch DOT tires. Um, if you came IFS, you have to stay IFS. If you came leaf sprung, you have to stay on leaf springs, that kind okay. of thing. You have to maintain 80% of your body panels. Um, <laughs> stock motor, you have to keep the stock motor you can't do any kind of ls swaps or anything like that um stock transmission um and we can have any transfer case and any axles we want and that's specific to that class that i mean obviously they all change every class correct and, and then the, the big boys i mean like the the big competitors unlimited class. the unlimited okay so yeah. those things are just like ridiculous yes those are sky's the limit and these are if to put it into perspective for anyone that's never heard of King of the Hammers, maybe they've heard of the Baja 1000. You've seen trophy trucks and things like that. Well, imagine taking a trophy truck that's, you know, most of those are still two-wheel drive these days. They, mm. they just go fast through the desert. And making that rock crawl. So you put IFS on it. You put 40-inch sticky tires on it. You know, it's it's... Like I said, sky's the limit. It's crazy what these guys have come up with the last couple of years. Would you ever want to go into the unlimited class, or are you happy with the competition? That that's a that's a really far dream. <laughs> that's a real far. Okay. <laughs> I, I, like I'm not at that point as a builder where I've figured out what I want for a formula for that kind of thing, but I'm getting there. Okay. So I didn't know if like I, I don't mean that you had have to have that as a goal. I just wondered, can you lock into a class that you're like, I'm content to be here? I doesn't mean I have to go and jump. Right. No, I am. I am perfectly happy in stock class. Uh, okay. Honestly, like uh, Samurai is obviously not the idea of ideal vehicle for it. Um, I'm probably never going to place very well. But the community behind 4600 stock class is primo. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bunch of really good people. So. And that makes a difference. Yeah. I mean, because it really is about the overall experience. It's not just about competing and winning and, or, or trying to win or whatever. It's, yeah. it's going to be the life you're living leading up to during. Yeah. And, and like you said, when you idea. first experienced King of the Hammers, you were like, these are my people. So you're just getting to spend. I know you guys go out there early. You're, you're training. It's a, it's a a group effort in a sense. Oh, yeah. It's a community effort. Oh, for sure. For <laughs> yeah. sure. It's, I think our camp alone is like I think we rope off about an acre or two, and I want to say we've got probably 50 people that camp with that's us. That's awesome. not just my team. Like, that's just all friends. And so I'm out there. My my parents get there at least a week before. Um, me and my brother will stay the whole week, and we'll be pre-running and all that kind of stuff. And, like, I'll even go down during Thanksgiving and Christmas to be down there to run the trails just to get a little bit more experience in. That's awesome. Yeah. So I highly recommend anyone go out and see it. I, but take friends because it's going to be more less terrifying to camp with people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always have, you'll come across some lone guy in the middle of the lake bed and I'm like, you, you need okay? to join somebody. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know, right? You're going to get run over. Yeah. Like, you do are like, in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my advice, if you're going and you've never been there before, don't camp on the lake bed on the lake bed. Yeah. Try to camp up in the bushes to the Get west. out of the main thoroughfare of things. Yeah. Because I feel like it – well, okay. Oh, I got to tell my own story on this one because I understood the race, like the, the – 
the official race a little bit before I had gone the, for the first time. But I think what was like the most life altering experience was going after dark when it's a free for all. The nightlife. The nightlife is <laughs> unbelievable. And I don't think I, and I'm, you know, that's not generally the nightlife is not my scene when it comes to ex- like being outdoors. Oh, yeah. Um, like I love a campfire. I love to be at camp, but I'm not doing a ton of night runs. It's just not, never been my, my cup of tea. Right. I enjoy them when I do it, but. <laughs> um, but that we could, j- and I had someone else drive because it was like late at night and I'm like, I'm not driving out there. I don't know what I'm doing. This is crazy. <laughs> so I jumped in a vehicle with somebody else and I think we ended up at either back door or chocolate thunder. I'm not sure. Those are the two um, big spectator areas. Yeah. yeah. I have never and yet to ever experience that again. That was <laughs> the wildest thing I'd ever seen. And I, and maybe from my, my little like piece of the pie like we're less adrenaline a little more controlled because <laughs> when I approach an obstacle I'm not doing this all the time and so like I'm I'm a little more methodical and I got to drive this thing home so I start playing this whole game where like yeah. okay how do I need to get over this um I don't need to showboat over it I just need to get over it <laughs> <laughs> I know and that's that's a lot of the nightlife like I said you know it's chocolate thunder yeah. back door you're going and it's like you said a free-for-all it is a free-for-all so, that is an understatement yeah and so as soon as the race course closes every day like there's people on it I yeah. remember volunteering at back door my first couple years and we hadn't even closed the freaking race course yet and there were people lined up to come up back door in their rigs I was like get off the course yeah <laughs> they're still coming through there's still race cars up there <laughs> well in the Again, you just have to experience it. The, the view, because I was, whatever side I was up on, I was high on the on the obstacle. And so I could see down the obstacle and out the valley. And I remember, it was it was awe-inspiring to see, you know, everyone's got all the lights and the whips and all this stuff. And, so, and, and everyone's flashing and music's blaring. And <laughs> you get stuck on that obstacle, people will go over the top of you. It oh, was yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> just be prepared for that. <laughs> I, they, well, you just became a part of the obstacle. Yeah. Uh, but seeing just the sea of humanity and all of these vehicles all lined up and all getting ready in position or coming into park and all, everyone lining the sides and... I don't know. There was a, you got to do it. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's an experience. And that's, like I said, I got hooked my first year. It's real easy. Yeah. So note yeah. to self, unless I'm ready for that adventure, I probably shouldn't drive. Right. <laughs> but I do have to say my, one of the best ways to experience new events like that for me at least is volunteering. Okay. And I've been volunteering for that event since 2014, the first time I went. And my family has volunteered every year since. You know, my mom will usually take a big group of people and go do a checkpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll usually go out and run like a road crossing out in the middle of nowhere by myself because, you know, they always need help. How would we do that if we wanted to um, I believe they should have information on the King of a Hammers website, just kingofahammers.com. Okay. Um, there is a KOH Volunteers Facebook page okay. that's been a really good resource. I'm sure the experiences are unique because you're kind of a part of getting to see like a little bit behind the curtain or, or I don't know, that's a weird analogy for this, but. No, no, that's exactly how it is. Like you get to understand how the event is put on and yeah. it's just mind boggling. But they also have a really nice volunteer raffle too. Oh, so you can well, win like you a full set of tires or something. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or an RC car. <laughs> it's really cool. So will you be competing this year? Correct. And are you, what are you competing in? My samurai. You're going to do a samurai again? Yeah, I've, I haven't finished it yet. That's my one goal is to prove that my samurai can finish. Um, and so I'm back at it. <laughs> so it hasn't finished yet? Correct. I have not finished okay. yet. My, okay. Actually, it's kind of funny. My current furthest goal that I've made it was the very first year that I raced 114 miles of a 130 or 40 mile so course. Close. Yeah, I always like I can make it through the desert lap. I just never make it fast enough. Okay. Um, and the last two years I've been getting to the rock trails. Finally, I get to go rock crawling because that's all I want to do all day after driving a hundred miles in the desert is go rock crawling. <laughs> so this year I just have to drive much faster through the desert and then I can go rock crawling for the okay. rest of the day. <laughs> they get there. And so they come, I know, um, I mean, the, everyone's there for the big days and, it, you know, that's where all the, the big money, the helicopters show up and the whole thing. <laughs> you yeah, know, the well, big boys are running when the helicopters are Yeah, out. nowadays we have the desert classes too, which, you know, the 
the Baja truck, trucks. The trophy yeah, trucks. The, the trophy first weekend. And those guys bring so much extra, like, people in. The first weekend is now huge. It used to just be nothing. And, yeah, and I don't want to knock. Is it... Is it true trophy trucks that show up? I'm trying to figure is it's it's legit. Legit trophy okay, trucks. Because I don't yeah. I can see one and identify it as a trophy truck, but I'm like, I'm not sure if there's different classifications even within that. Yes. I mean there are, yeah. Okay. But these are like unlimited class, like the McMillan. The true. Show up. Oh got it. Yeah. All the all the big names come up. Um Rob McCra- the Rob McCacran. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the trophy truck drivers either, but it's the big names and it's invite only. I think they do like seven trucks and it's a big purse too. So it's so it's for a purse. Is it a part of their circuit like for their season? They I think it's just the one race. Okay. They don't have a circuit or anything. Okay. Like so it's it. it's not like they're part of Ultra 4, which is the King of a Hammer rock racing circuit right in the year. So Okay. So 7 years ago when <laughs> 7 years ago when I bought a Tacoma and I thought I was an off-roader cuz now I had a vehicle with four-wheel drive. This is this is how my brain worked. That's all you really Honestly, need. <laughs> I mean, coming from, like, never being off-road, I don't fault myself for thinking that way. It's just funny how different it is now. Um, but bought the vehicle, and I w- had wanted to just start exploring more and knew that would involve dirt and felt that my little vehicle's like, well, this isn't going to work. So I'm like, well, if I got something with four-wheel drive, and then I could go anywhere I wanted. Um, little did I know that, like, you know, camping with your vehicle and overlanding and four-wheel drive. And I, I knew that, like score or um, like the Baja races existed and kind of the extreme, but didn't really know that the normal person with a street legal vehicle could do any of this stuff. Fair Just enough. zero concept. Um, so about a year later, I realized like, oh, what did I fall into? <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I accidentally not knowing what I was like, what culture I was dropping into, bought like the first year of the third gen Tacoma in the new color. And so it was like, it just kind of like spun up, like everyone was like, oh, like, what are you going to do to the truck? And I'm like, why would I do anything to the truck? Like, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I will say I left the thing basically stock for a year very intentionally because I did not know how to drive. I knew I didn't know how to drive off road. And you know that now when you go back to a trail that you're like, I remember this trail scaring me. And you go back to it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a dirt road. What was wrong with me? Um, but it's amazing how your perception of off road changes. All that to say. Um, I'm so grateful that I kept it stock for as long as I did, because while you can go out and throw a bunch of gear on a, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, but no, I'd love to hear this (laughs) while, you know, you can go out and throw on a bunch of equipment that will make the vehicle more capable and make it easier to get around. And, but my ignorant opinion in the beginning was that I don't know how to do anything. So if I don't learn how to, like, the limitations of my vehicle now, and I wasn't sold on spending, like, five grand on a suspension and, you know, redoing this and and dumping money into something if I wasn't really going to enjoy it. So I really wanted to see, like, well, I need to enjoy it at its lowest form, as it at its least capable. And then I know I will learn the truck. I'll learn the limitations. I know where the, you know, where I'm going to bottom out here and, okay, well, can't do that. You're... And that was so beneficial. And I'm so glad I did that because now when people jump into overlanding or whatever and they go, you know, what's the first thing I should do? I'm like, make sure you got a good set of tires and go. Exactly. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, my gosh. But it's because, one, you're going to learn. One, don't invest in this because you may just do this a few times a year and it's not worth thousands of dollars because you can do it in a stock vehicle. Yes. Which you know. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But also – I don't know. I think the part like being responsible out on the trail is not just throwing 35s and wheeling over something because you can like know, know the know the proper lines to take and um, and being safe because you're going to come across a situation that is going to be outside the norm. And if you didn't have those basics, you're really putting yourself in danger, people around you in danger at a disadvantage. Um, And I don't know if sometimes that's like the female brain in me that I'm like less worried about showing off that's not that that's not in there but that that's less of a priority than just kind of like i kind of just need to survive this and in the beginning everything's terrifying yeah um so i i, I enjoyed that cycle in the beginning and it, then it gives me the ability to tell that to other people yeah. i don't know if any of them listen though because i feel like in the instagram world everyone just wants to like throw all the stuff on the vehicle immediately 
but that's i mean we all have have to have someone to look up to you know that might just be the instagram world whereas in the w- real world hopefully people are out wheeling their stock trucks and just not posting about it yeah <laughs> But we're going to make stock trucks cool again. Heck yes. <laughs> but yeah, no, like I, I totally agree with you. Keeping your truck stock at mm. first and um, working up that, this is going to sound weird for anyone that's never heard of it, but working up that butt feeling. Like that's how you become a better driver is just feeling what your vehicle is doing through your butt in your in seat. seat. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, become a better driver before you start throwing parts at it. <laughs> yeah. And that, no, I, that's, that's a great way to do it. Cause I mean, a great way to put a picture to that. Cause it really is, it's the feel of your vehicle off-road yeah. and that is the biggest skill. There's nothing you can go through. Like it's just time in the seat. So, yeah. So I wanted to hear what <laughs> your experience was with Jesse Combs, like how she inspired you. So Jesse was just, um, it was always like, you know, one degree of separation, when I first started, uh, and I think somehow her and I had interacted just briefly through direct messages on social media. And she was like, oh, I, <laughs> at the time, I had no grasp of like what she had done and who she really was. Right. Um, and I think she sent me a message and was just like, hey, I really love what you're doing. Just an encouraging like little blurb in my DMs. And just like, I love what you're doing. And I was like, thanks. Like, you know, I'm just, I was like, it was in my first year. And I remember going to the Toyota dealership who was a guy who did off-road stuff and being like, this lady like said something to me. And I'm like, we're talking to him about it. And, you know, kind of just got tucked away. And I went on my, went on my way. And then she would always pop up. And then we, I started kind of following her, um, kind of her pursuit of the record out and her speed record. Yeah. Um, but honestly, it was just as a fan. Um, but I kind of like locked in on her right near uh, right before she was up in Oregon so right at the time where I was able to really focus on like having a hero with like it all just kind of like disintegrated oh man and so I kind of learned more about who she was the gravity of who she was kind of after the fact okay um but it was but I like that my experience with her was very organic yeah um I'm not one for like celebrity which I'm sure she would appreciate because I don't think she was into that part of it either right. um but like i knew I, I know rochelle really well and so i've kind of like learned about jesse through rochelle um i have a relationship with uh jane thurman and like her relationship her and Teresa's relation like it's so i'm like get to hear these stories from women who worked alongside her uh, or raced with her because i know Teresa raced with her right. but do you have a story with her as well yeah oh well, eh. or I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat as you is I was just kind of a fan. I never Mm -hmm. actually got to have a personal relationship with her. Um, But for those listening that didn't know Jessie, she set – let me back all the way up. She was one of the first, like, female influential people in, like, the automotive space, in welding, in Mm -hmm. off-roading. So – She had, like, a show, like, that kind of – started her right yeah was that, like, she a was on a show she was on extreme four by four that's right and overhauling and she i mean there were a bunch of them all girls garage mm-hmm. i've watched all of them <laughs> you know but i um grew up probably like before i left high school extreme four by four was on tv every sunday morning and my brothers would watch it because they were in off-roading and i'm like there's a chick on tv and she's like working on rigs yeah. and like off-roading and doing all this stuff with these guys and i'm like I don't see any other chicks doing this, but she's like me. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to do that. Um, so I was in community college and I had my samurai and I wanted to put a set of rock sliders on my samurai. And I, I you know, I'm a, I'm just a poor college kid. I can't afford anything. So I was like, all right, I'm going to build a set. So I took a welding class to try to build a set of rock sliders. Oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I... Okay, so I never actually finished the rock sliders in that class, and I ended up taking all the welding classes that the community college offered. But in my very second class in, like, the lecture portion, I saw Jesse in an American Welding Society video, and I was, like, between careers at that point, and I was, like, and I saw Jesse, and I was, like, well, if Jesse can do it, I can do it. So I became a welder. Ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> and so that was, like, kind of one of the big pivotal points that she gave to me um and i'd been following her for a long time i I got to meet her a couple times at king of the hammers and um sema and fab tech and things like that we were always kind of like in the same space um but after 
she passed away the day after I was talking to my brother on the phone and he was a big fan of her too. And we were kind of like going back and forth reminiscing about it. Um, and I, I told him, I was like, I kind of want to race King of the Hammers. And he's like, do it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> so I had my samurai ready in five months awesome. to race King of the Hammers. Yep. And then, um, because she was so influential to me, um, she passed away in August 2019. The Jesse Combs Foundation was founded in her honor to educate, inspire, and empower the next generation of female trail trailblazers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had one of my friends hand paint the Jesse Combs Foundation logo on the roof of my race car. Mm -hmm. And so they had a booth that year at King of Hammers and they approached me and I got to know everyone from the foundation and um, kind of just been supporting the message ever since that's awesome oh, yeah <laughs> and that's that's a um, i know it, it took a little bit to get it off the ground but i mean you're starting to really see uh, the impact and like kind of the um uh, the foundation is there so now they're starting to be you're starting to see it more which yeah. is great it, I'm, yeah they have a scholarship program every year that they hand out to young women in the trades yeah oh. and it's a good i know i, I mean when individuals who are influential in our lives pass away, I know there's always um, a great amount of reverence that gets put towards them, whether warranted or not. It's just kind of what we do. It, we we memorialize people. But with Jesse, it was, and I didn't even have like a you know personal relationship with her, but I think her impact was it's just maybe because there's a few of us. Like there's we are in a male dominated sport, right? Um, and I love that. And sometimes that's challenging and, you know, all the, all the, when we can talk about that more, especially with King of the Hammers, but her impact was huge because I think we just kind of, there's a sisterhood that regardless of whether we've met each other, but we kind of are all in the same, we know what it feels like to be the only girl somewhere. Yeah. And I'm not, a, we're not victims by it at all, but we, it, but it's different. It makes our experience just different. And so there's just like a, a unification, like where you just, like, I feel connected to you. I yeah. feel like <laughs> we know we, we share a, a common experience. Yeah, Like you said, sisterhood is a really good word for mm -hmm. it. Like we're all out there in a male dominated field. You can pick us out like, right. <laughs> you know, so a little ponytail bobbing around or something. Right? <laughs> That's always like, oh, there's, there's a, a girl. Connection. Oh. Um, so I know she did King of the Hammers. What is the like, is it still I mean, I know we're, we're just a small percentage, but I, it's got to be coming women competing in like King of the Hammers. Are there more of, are you still one of the only ones out there? Are there more of you? Is <laughs> I want to say there's more of us now than there was before. Um, I know Jesse wasn't the first or only one to like finish or finish well in right. King of the Hammers. Um, I don't actually know the specific, specific statistics for women that compete in King of the Hammers, but I can tell you um, it's, I'm treated as more of an equal there mm. than I am in welding. Okay. Like in in my racing career, I'm treated more of an equal than in my the respect career. of that samurai. Like that propelled you to like everyone was like, oh, I'm gonna <laughs> nod my head. To that. <laughs> that was epically badass. With that. I that's what I got, so I raced it. <laughs> no, but there's there's something out oh, there. I don't even know if I can convey that correctly. There's just like you got maybe you have to be in the sport, but like it's badass. That is, and I don't like that term all the time. I agree but with I, you. I think, but yeah. that it qualifies. I think it's it gets used too much, right? Yeah, it okay. was definitely a special experience. I mean, you know, you have the unlimited class cars and King of the Hammers right. that are six hundred to twelve hundred horsepower, and they're on forty to forty two inch tall tires and independent know what suspension. Like. <laughs> they're massive and they're fast and they're deadly too yeah and i'm in a suzuki samurai it weighs 2500 pounds soaking wet it's on it was on 31 inch tall tires the first year i raced it has 60 horsepower and a carbureted motor and a manual transmission you get crazy respect for, <laughs> right, for i love it that's a, like i always knew it i i know it can rock crawl mm -hmm. i know how to do that i'm just it won't run through the desert very fast <laughs> okay this year it's happening this year. Oh, yeah, it's happening this year. I'm getting that's that's one of the big perks of my job is that I get to go out and like do R&D on my own stuff mm. to try to make it faster, basically. So for those that 
don't know. Can I go into my job? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. No, I was going to say, let's say what you're doing. Yeah. So like I, I mentioned before, I work for Randy Slauson at Bomber Fabrication. He's won King of the Hammers three times. We build those race cars that have won. I think um, one of the cool statistics about Bomber Fabrication is that every race car that's come out of the shop is still kicking. None of them have been like scrapped or parted out or anything like that. And I think I counted 11 bombers go off the line, the start finish line wow. at King of the Hammers Unlimited class last year. Wow, that's yeah. great. There's a lot more out there than you think. Um, but they're super high quality cars, obviously. You know, it was those cars were built in a time when it was just a bunch of rock donkeys mm -hmm. out in the desert trying to get King of the Hammers. And um, they came in and built a car that was trophy truck okay. quality, right. basically. Um, so I'm a welder there. <laughs> um, if you see a newer bomber that was built after 2021, 90% of the welds are mine. Um, and we build the things from the ground up. She gets to own badass. So you just get to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's my day job. No, that's super. I love, I, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I'd been welding for six years beforehand and, and working at Bomber had always kind of been like a dream job for mm -hmm. me because I started welding after my first King of the Hammers in 2014 and I saw Bomber Fabrication. And I was like, well, they're kind of close to me. Like, I could work there. Mm. <laughs> That's oh. But I need to get I, well, so I got I got the bug to like, well, I wanted to just at least go weld something because I was like being in the like seeing the sport, the the sport of what we do while welding isn't a daily or a need for me in what I do. I, I'm like I've been around enough people who are like, oh, we'll just we'll do this type of weld here. We'll fix something this way. And it's like I have no concept of what that is even about. So I <laughs> actually got together a group of women and we went um, out to uh, flying Dutchman. Why can't I think of his name? Jake. Thank you. <laughs> um, and he's got a shop down south. And I was like, hey, I know you do classes. Like, what if I brought 10 women? And he was like, absolutely. Like, when do you, <laughs> when do you want to come out? So we all just like signed up for this class. And so it was a bunch of like relatively friends most of us are all from like the overland community so no one has any experience but it's kind of like well i just kind of i just would like to know the mechanics of it right yeah it, it i feel like it's one of those um almost essential things that you have to learn in off-roading right yeah. yeah well i think if you're going to pursue it with some serious like effort yeah i do think i mean at some point trail repairs get that gnarly yeah or I just think knowledge is amazing. So, I mean, like, maybe it's not my vehicle, but to be able to not – to watch something happen on the trail and, like, to be able to understand what's going on. I think it just – it increases your knowledge exponentially when you can have a grasp of that stuff. Right. And I'm hands-on. So you can tell me all day how to do something, and I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah. And when you're out the other Yeah, right, I'm like, I have way. no idea. So <laughs> I knew I'd have to, like, go and figure it out. I was not good at it, which was kind of disheartening, um, at least – didn't make me want to like jump into the field of welding. I was like, okay, well, but we did um, TIG welding. Ooh. So we jumped kind of into something. Like we didn't start at like where I think most people were at the like MIG or. Yeah. TIG is definitely the deep end. Yeah. So we jumped <laughs> like he, I don't know why he decided to do that. I had no, he's like, we're going to teach you TIG welding. And I'm Perfect. like, great. I have no idea what that is. It's like the cleanest process you can imagine. So <laughs> you it don't was... get covered in metal. Okay. Well then maybe that's why he did it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> But we had a great time, and I think I need – it would be great to go back into doing that. Maybe just even as, like, a hobby, but just to – like, you'd only get better as you continue to do it. Yeah. Like so. I said, I've been I've been doing it for seven years now, um, and I just started because I wanted to build a set of rock sliders for yeah. my samurai. You know, it, it all kind of evolved because of off-road, so it's nice to kind of be back in off-road. Well, you know, I, we were chatting earlier, and I told you kind of a dream would be to, like, have – the Tacoma that I have, which is a third gen and looks fine on the outside. But if you get underneath it or inside it, it's getting a little, it's been banged up. Um, so I'm starting to realize that there's just certain components of the truck that probably aren't going to make it much longer. So <laughs> it's like, so what do I want to do with this is kind of the plan. And uh, I jokingly was like, I'm just going to drop it off at a shop, but maybe I should go get my butt in the shop and try to figure something out. I know. I, why did I say this on camera? Anyway. <laughs> if we had all the money and all the time, we would do all the stuff ourselves. I know. Wouldn't that be great? The uh, dream of like having your own garage like on 
at, at your home, like someplace, a shop of some sort. Where, where I you can could, just explode my whole vehicle and yeah. leave it there overnight? Because I can't do that yes. in my neighborhood. Like, I don't have a garage that size. And it's like, I can't, I can't. I can barely do like a tire rotation in front of my house with the way everything works. So right. I'm like, I would great to have like a piece of property with something. The dream property is always a small house and a huge garage. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I don't need a lot to live, but I'm going to need a lot of stuff for the toys. Yes. Um, before we leave the welding topic, I think I, because I think there's there's a, a fun element to being a female, a lone female, or a like just not there's not a lot of us in what we do. And I I think some of the commonality when I talk to other women who are similar to, you know, like they do something and they're just they're always outnumbered or they're one of two or whatever. I think the commonality is I found like I always like hung out with the boys as a kid. And I don't know, I mean, whether you've got family members or like there was always the boys in the neighborhood and the, the boys were always working on something in a garage. And I was like always in the garage. I don't know if I was ever helping, but just found that way more interesting than whatever the girls were doing. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> um, that to be said, I think as we carry that into adulthood, that sometimes looks like, you know, us out in an off-road thing. And it's like, oh, there's just dudes out here. All right. And I love it. I think I th I thrive in that. And I'm going to guess that there's some part of that that, like, you enjoy as well. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't show up every day right, if you yeah. were just like, this is awful. So while we use that, like, wow, there's I'm in a male-dominated sport, I don't say that to make it sound like we're being – Outnumbered. Or that, like, it's a, all negative. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That those ratios are bad. But it does create a unique experience. Oh, for sure. <laughs> because there is definitely something about being outnumbered. Um, but your experience jumping into the welding industry, I mean, we know that heavily male dominated. How many times have I said that word? It's it's hard. There's to a lot of dudes yeah. in the shop doing welding. <laughs> it's all dudes in most shops doing. Welding. Okay, there yeah. you go. So I, um, what does starting that look like? If there was someone out there that was like, "Hey, I think that might be interesting." Like, oh, what okay. is that experience like? So here's my biggest point of advice to new welding students is they will tell you going into welding school that you're going to come out and make $100,000 a year. That is so not true. Okay. <laughs> Unless you want to go be a pipe fitter or something like that and you want to be super remote and not have a life, you're not going to make $100,000 a year come straight out of high college. Okay. Um, you have to start sweeping floors. <laughs> Everyone starts at the bottom. You have to pay your dues and you know, I'm not going to say no one's going to take you seriously in your in your first five years, but um, it's, you know, nothing's handed to you. Got it. Um, that was especially true for me because um, I was one of two females in my first couple welding classes. Um, I was the first female to work at the first shop that I worked at. The second shop that I worked at, they actually hired me because I was female. They seeked me out on Indeed and emailed me because I was a female welder. Okay. So there are shops out there like that. Um, the third shop I worked at, I was, again, the first female in the whole shop in a, in a shop of 50 guys. And it was a big learning experience for them as it was for me. Like, I, I come in and, you know, I know what I can handle and how to be professional in an environment and they have no idea what to do with me. Like, they had talks beforehand. They they you know, they went to all the guys in the welding department. They're like, you can't play this music anymore. <laughs> Stuff like that. And, you know, they get to know you over time. But um, what am I trying to say? It's, it's, it's new. And it's... What mentality do you think you want to, like, need to adopt to survive that? Just work hard. I one of the statistics that sticks out to most of me because a female welder they'll tell you um, girls are better at welding because they have more patience or something like that. I've heard that from multiple people. The truth is, females in male dominated areas have to work twice as hard to make themselves seen to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's really all it takes. Like, we will work twice as hard. And it will be seen. Um, you can be as good as you want to be. I All I want ever wanted to be was the best. And if you can put your mind to it, 
anything worth doing is worth doing 100%. Mm. So. Well, yeah, and it's not going to be handed to you at all. Like, yeah. I, like, I think that's, we've gotten away from that as a society in general. I mean, I think the idea of, of hard work being a part of everything we do, uh, I just feel like that concept has somehow gotten lost in translation as we move moved on. But what's fun about the off-road space is I think it's really, it's a real, f like you have to put in the work. You have to, the the the, the welding and the, and the type of fabrication and the building of these vehicles, like that's not something you can just drop into and be like, I'm smart, I can figure this out. It's like, no, that's time busting your knuckles, doing things the wrong way, taking things apart, putting it all together and going, nope, that doesn't work and tearing it all down again. I mean, yep. there's failure after failure and hard work after, and like perseverance, all of those things. So there is a, a real beauty to men and women going through the off-road sport, I think. But it's fun to hear the perspective of a, like a female. Because again, it's very, I think it's unique. It's very, well, you know it's unique. <laughs> I don't think it's unique, it is. Yeah, one of those quotes that really stands out to me again is, um, the master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. Mm. And that's something I try to impress, impress on people in anything they do, whether it be off-roading or racing or welding or whatever they want to pursue. You're not going to get better at it if you don't try. You're going to suck at it. You're going to fail so many times. And you have to pick yourself back up and not put yourself down. And you look at it as a learning experience instead of just like, oh, I sucked at this. I never want to do this again. And then you get better at it. And eventually, you're the best, you know? Yeah. Speaking of women in the field, I was curious about your ladies' night campouts. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Although it, it dwarfs in comparison to what all the topics we just talked about. But... It's been cool doing this as a hobby. It's, it's always been like, I just do this for fun. You know, I enjoy being outdoors and I just really didn't want any responsibility attached to it. I didn't want any leadership roles. I didn't want any, um, I didn't want to organize things. I didn't like doing that. I'm like, no, I do this for me. And it's my therapy, very selfish mentality. Um, but being a lone female on a lot of either group runs or just on social media, the presence is just, there's just not a lot of women out there taking their vehicle out into the back country and posting about it. Um, people start asking a lot of questions like, hey, like, can I come out? <laughs> My favorite is like, hey, can I come out with you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, no. Um, person I don't know from the internet. I mean, I am old enough to like, we just didn't quite, you don't do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> and women should not do that at all. Um, but it was like a couple years of just kind of getting pursued by other women uh, or, or husbands going, hey, I would love for my wife to, like, I think she'd be interested. Like, can she go out with you? Or can, can you do something where you can take women out? And I just really, I, I stiff-armed that for a long time. Um, and honestly, the reason was, I was like, large groups of women are just not my thing. Um, I, I just, I don't. I don't have any desire for that. And then I got real, real selfish. And I was like, you know, there was no other women dragging me out and I figured it out. So why don't you all just go out and figure it out? It was kind of this very crass, very like all about me mentality. But I started to get frustrated with the community on my own in kind of a different lane. But like, you know, they'd be doing these things and then there, there wasn't really a spot for women to exist within the, like a company would put on something and I was like, well, we, can we do something over here? And there just wasn't a lot of thought put on it or, or, or I'd laugh like a clothing company would come out with something. And I was like, there's nothing for us. Like we want to be a part of the community. Like, can we have like something that kind of fits like we'd want it to. All right. Um, and so for another year, I just complained about, you know, my own complaint. And then I don't know, I had girlfriends and encouragement along the way, but finally someone was like, why don't you just do so do something on your own? Like, I guess that's what I have to do. If I want to complain why it doesn't exist, why isn't there this opportunity out there? Um, if you keep hearing that, like, maybe you should do something. <laughs> well. <laughs> so, um, I mean, this amazing epiphany I had. Anyway, so in 2019, I just put out a bulletin on social media and it was like, hey, like we're going to do a ladies' night camp out. We'll cap it at, I think I capped it at like 20 vehicles or something. And, um, that's a lot. It, it was too many to, to <laughs> be completely fair. <laughs> but I was trying to include everybody and, uh, you know, got a great response immediately. I think it filled up in like two days. Wow. Um, and it's it was all done through social media and it was done um, 
I did require, so I, I had some vehicle requirements just so that I didn't have someone just with a street vehicle and I didn't quite like, wait, what if we get you in this situation you're not supposed to be in? Right. Um, but I required, and it was a buy-in that the reason for the requirement was I just didn't want to flake. I didn't want someone to sign up and I, cause I wasn't charging you anything. Right. And I didn't want you to hold a spot. And then three days before, like you just bail. I'm like, no, these are coveted spots. Like you have to commit to coming. Um, but it was just one night in the desert. I required that they change a tire on their vehicle before they came out. It's totally selfish because I didn't want to have to do it for them. No, that's totally smart. You kind of have to, like you said, a buy-in. You have to prove that you want to do it. How bad do you want to do it? And what's so funny is, ladies, the pushback I have received on changing a tire is hysterical. And for all of the desire that women want to be involved in this thing – And I've had women who are like, I crawl every weekend or I go out all the time and I do this like, I know how to change a tire. I'm like, yeah, I I need you to do it. Just do it. (laughs) Okay. Do it and send the photos. (laughs) (laughs) But they're like, but, but I, and I'm like, I I get what you're saying. I have full, but, but you have to understand the whole point of this is I need you to commit to the event that we're going to. So I'm sure I ruffled feathers along the way, but I, I stuck to it. Um, so they have to change a tire. And it's literally just a camping trip. Um, sometimes we trail. Sometimes we don't. It's 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 It varies depending on what where we're at. But we've done them in, I think, six or seven states. Um, 2021, we did 10 events um, everywhere. I tried to pull off one a month. That was a little bit off a little bit more than I could chew. Uh, you jump in the deep end and I love it. Yeah, kind of, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> Baptism <laughs> by fire. Just keep going. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll survive. I mean, I, I'll figure it out. It's like sink or swim, and usually I usually I swim. So, um, kind of float a little on the water. Yeah, but I I also <laughs> I'm like an all that all or nothing. I like to feel everything at the like highest intensity. <laughs> so the stress I think with an event like that, while now I'm like, oh, I won't do it that at that pace again. Um, was it, it was a great year. The plan is to keep them going. Good. And it's really just to create community. Um, I don't really care about what we're doing so much because I know that those times around the campfire with them have been the most impactful because you're bringing women from all walks of life. And we do this thing where we we hand each <laughs> – it's a Lucy light. Um, it's very silly. But whatever. It works. Um, we sit around the fire and I, if you're holding the light, it's like you have you have the circle. The talking stick. And so I, yeah, it's the talking <laughs> stick. It totally is. Anyway, everyone loves it, (laughs) but we do this. And I just ask like simple questions like, you know, where are you from? How long have you been doing this? What, what got you into it? And then why do you continue doing it? And so everyone's story, you know, we've got, you know, first timers is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Um, Or, you know, I normally go out with my husband, boyfriend, whatever, and he does everything. And I thought maybe I could do it for the first time. Or I've been doing this since I was a kid. Um, this is something I love. I did it with my family. And so you're bringing these, like, everyone's got these different stories. And I don't really have to do anything. They all connect with each other. So the pressure for me to, like, get along with 20 women or 15 women or 10 women, whoever's out, isn't there. It's just about, like, taking action, bringing them together, and they connect with each other. So you watch them, like, cooking over there together, or this group is chatting over here. And then a month later, I hear, hey, a group of us are going to, you know, we're going to go to Grand Canyon. We're going to go hit the desert over here. I have nothing to do with those groups. But they're little groups of this of girls that met together, and now they're forming their own ladies' night campouts. They do – there's girls that two years running have done, like, a, a Galentine's thing out in the desert. So for Valentine's Day, they all get together in the camp. Oh, that's cool. And I – again, it's very small, but walking away from, like, a couple of years of doing it, that's the impact you can have on your small community – and like then you're watching much bigger. You're watching you them impact each other. And then they're bringing women that I don't know, like out, you know, oh, my girlfriend wants to try this out. So you need to just even if you don't understand it, you need to just step out into stuff because I think there's opportunities and ways to inspire and push people um, in ways that you can't even imagine until it's happening. Right. Everybody has to start somewhere. Yeah. And I like honestly, everything that you just told me is just, like light bulb moment. Like you probably have no idea how impactful it probably is on all these women's lives. And I think it's great that you're still doing it. <laughs> Just, please keep doing it. 
And I will. And I, it's, there's times where I'm like, oh, I don't want to, like, because organizing an event, any event, is just like, it's just not my favorite thing to do. It's just, it's, it's, it's more, it requires me to be more responsible than I want to be sometimes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know how that is. But, uh, but yeah, the benefits have been amazing. So it's cool to see that. And, that, and I know that's kind of central to the overlanding community, but I, I think it can stretch beyond that because, again, women are social. And I think the power of us sitting around and sharing our stories with each other is so unifying, um, very unique to women. I, men connect as well, but I think women just have a, a very special bonding moment. So, And it's good for us to have like our own space. Yes, too. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I can't let you go without, because I know, I know conservation and land management is something that's been important to you. And is some, you know, you're constantly either just talking about that or getting involved in whatever is out there. So let's, I think for those that aren't a, a part of the off-road space, we here in the Southwest have a very unique experience when it comes to off-road land use. Um, and jump in any time and correct me or whatever, talk over me. Um, we have access to a lot of uh, BLM land, Bureau of Land Management. And this is um, public land that is managed by our government or government entities. Um, but it is usually open use for the most part. There are rules and restrictions. You can't camp forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, you need to stay on trail and there's respect for the land and, um, you know, the the very minimal rules, honestly, that are out there. Don't be an idiot. Don't leave your trash out there. Yeah, pretty much. Um, leave it better than you found it. A lot of the tread lightly principles are applied. Mm -hmm. um, but what's been your experience as far as – I'm grateful that we have that, but I think I know how quickly we can have these things taken away. Yeah. Because – managing these areas is not easy sometimes and it's definitely not cheap and it takes a lot of manpower that i don't think i, I, I won't say i want to believe that most off-roaders know what it takes to keep trails open but i, I want, also want to say that they don't like no one drives Rubicon Trail and sees, oh, they've put trees down over here to keep people from going off trail. Like, how many volunteers did it take? How many hours to make the trail better like that? Um, and something I always try to, you know, voice, get out there is, like, people need to volunteer more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, like I keep saying, it takes a lot of man hours to keep our trails open. You were talking about BLM land in the West. We also have OHVs. Right. You know, and those are open use. You can pretty much drive wherever you want. Um, BLM, you can't drive where you want. You have to stay on the trail. Right. Um, and then, like, um, trails like Rubicon. They have Rubicon Trail Foundation in terms of Rubicon and stuff like that. And it's completely volunteer-based these people take time out of their lives. You know, they have day jobs. They don't just do Rubicon Trail Foundation for a living and get paid for it because it doesn't make any money. Um, and they organize volunteers to go out and knock down the snow wall on the Tahoe side or um, put in more gravel so that erosion doesn't eat the trail completely away. Mm -hmm. Um like I said before, I've been volunteering for King of Hammers. I've volunteered for Rubicon Trail Foundation before. I've done, you know, every time I'm on the trail, I'm picking up trash. Yeah. You know, that's what my bag's for. Um, but just we were talking earlier off camera about what just happened in Moab. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great transition and how um, Blue Ribbon Coalition spearheaded the effort to try to um, publicize it, I mm. guess, and get the word out. Get the word That's out. Yeah, hard. exactly. What happened was BLM came in and said, um, we have options A, B, or C. We're either going to close all the trails in Gemini Bridges, which is just north of Moab, or we're not going to close any of the trails. Mm. And I think we got the middle option. <laughs> and I was just disheartened because, you know, how many people actually saw you know, click here, sign your name on the petition, help us keep our trails open. It takes two minutes. And they had like 2,000 signatures. 2,000 people actually took the two minutes to try to do the minimal amount of work possible to keep our trails open. Like, we're not asking you to go out and shovel sand 
for 12 hours a day, which is what some volunteers do to keep our trails open. We're asking you to do a two minute survey. Like it's not hard. So I, I try to impress on people that there, there's small things that you can do. And um, one of the things I heard about early on in my career um, that really impressed me was an article in Peterson's Four Wheel Drive about a group of Belgians that flew their Jeeps over here from Belgium to do Rubicon Trail. Because in Belgium, you can't modify your vehicle. Okay. You, <laughs> they can't drive off road. They don't have any of that there. So they there's this Jeep group out there that I guess they go out of Belgium to go off roading, but like they wanted to come to That's do commitment. Rubicon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can't right. Do it in your own country, so <laughs> exactly. And and out west, we are we're spoiled, honestly. Yeah. Like we've got BLM, we've got OHBs, we've got um, SVRAs in California, stuff like that. Um, and we don't appreciate that all this can just be taken away from us. Yeah, it's you know here in the east, all they have is private land. Right. Right. I think that's most of Texas as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in. Well, we get a unique experience living in the Southwest, I think. And so, and it's special. And I don't think we value it enough. It's one of those things we kind of, I mean, I feel like being from this area, it's like, oh, I was kind of born into it. Like, it's just always how it's been. Yeah. And so it is easy. And I and I do fall, um, I'm guilty of not valuing it the way I should. Not in a destructive way, but just not even like giving thought to well, what is really required to keep this going the way it is. Right. But I think we're seeing kind of an influx of with the, you know, the release of the Broncos and you're watching the evolution of Jeeps and and these are vehicles that you can buy off the lot that are very capable off-road. And overlanding has become kind of the like transition into this world where people are realizing, "Oh, I can I can drive on there's trails, there's places." Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of new people come onto the trails. A lot of new people are choosing to camp further out. There's also this, the whole side-by-side -side sector, too. Oh, that's, That has brought so many people That's an in. incredible, yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but that, that's an interesting, uh, and that's just happening. And I know people want to complain about a lot of that, but it's like, I could hear the complaint about that when, like, overlanding we got like spiked you know a couple of years ago so you it's know like, what as long as they're not trashing the trails like they are more than welcome absolutely please come out be a part of our community spend your money in our marketplace but like, understand yeah but understand that there is a there may not be a cost to these trails because they're free access but there is a responsibility absolutely and and there's a mindset and a and a, a, a way to conduct yourself out there uh so take you have to take I don't know, you just you have to understand that there is a cost involved. And so I think, yeah, just speaking about that, if you have a local area that you love, find out how you can be more involved, yeah. whether that's, you know, man hours on the trail or monetarily or or like you said, just signing a petition. Like, yeah. make sure you just open up those links and get involved as much as you can. This because is, I'm going to interrupt you right there and, go, and go on a little tangent, because like, you know, back in the day we had Jeep clubs and these were organized clubs of 30 50 people in their jeeps and they'd go out and do trail maintenance they still do that to this day they are dwindling mm -hmm. there nobody wants to sign up to be part of jeep clubs anymore i think uh i don't want to say cal four wheel membership is gone down oh i bet it has yeah i bet it has though yeah. um and and there's this disconnect like in my generation you're on a facebook group and you can go on a facebook group and find a run like they used to do in jeep groups back mm -hmm. in the day but um, I I have seen a couple like social media based groups going out and doing like trail cleanups and maintenance right. items and things like that. But I um, we need to make the transition between the Jeep clubs that meet at the pizza shop every Thursday or whatever during the month to the Facebook groups where, um, you know, we're posting about all these trails that we run all the time and we need to spend a weekend out of the month maintaining them. Yeah. It, there's all the excuses in the book, but I think, and so I'm not us speaking of this. I know we're all guilty of this at some level of, of just not, maybe not putting in the time, you right. know, or making it a priority. But I think it needs to be a unifying effort. And then I, I just think the further you get into this industry or the further you get into the community, like that is just a part of being there because the government wants to close this stuff. The, they want they don't have the manpower to manage this. Exactly. And I know like uh, I'm you know local to Southern California and L.A. has a local mountain range. And once upon a time, there was there was all kinds of beautiful historic scenic dirt roads back there. 
And I remember when I first started, I, I had a map and I was like, oh, like they're right here. They're like an hour away. Like, let's go up there. And was ended up in closure after closure after closure of these like, you know, well, well documented trails. And I'm like, yeah. why are these all closed? And I remember finding a ranger and it was like, oh, there was a storm two years ago. And no one wants to clear the down trees. And we're probably just never going to clean it up. Yeah. And I'm so like, so that's how easily that stuff, natural disaster, I mean, something none of us can control, but like, if there's an excuse, if there's not, you know, community support, um, and we do owe those like old school Jeep groups a lot because I mean, like the Anza Borrego desert, all of those trails were cut by those groups. Yep. They created all the trails that we know about out there that we frequent. Same with the Amherst trails, man. Yeah. Yep. So like we, we, if we want to be in the same lineage, the same, you know, carry the same heritage of like these people, you know, 20, 30 years ago that were out there doing that. Um, I think it's just our responsibility. Yeah. We have to, as a community, we have to step up our game. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. And and I'm I'll be the first to admit I'm guilty of the same thing where like I haven't made a priority and I wish I did more. Yeah. You know, I try to get out there and do one kind of volunteer project every year and if everyone in the community did that trails would never close. How about this year you and I do something? Like just to, so we make sure we're doing another one. You and I will do something together. So we we'll pick one, find one, I'll drive to it. We'll go. Okay. We'll we're it. there. Okay. <laughs> yes. Doing it. All right. Well, thank you for your time. And I know coming all the way out here, I appreciate you. You're busy. <laughs> but we're going to be rooting for you for King of the Hammers. And maybe I'll be out there telling you which way to go. I don't know. I think that's a big responsibility. But oh. it'd be fun to come out and see you. If you want to get behind the scenes, you're more than welcome to come hang out with okay. us. A ways to donate or ways to get involved with what your team's doing? Yeah. So um, this year, King of the Hammers is doing something kind of cool for racers because it's so expensive for us to race. Um, if you go on the King of the Hammers website kingofthehammers.com and you purchase your um participant spectator tickets like you know just tickets to get into the event um you can choose my name on a drop down list and i get 10 bucks back towards my registration fees awesome they also have t-shirts with my logo on the back and the king of the hammers logo on the front for sale they're doing this for all the teams so anyone that submits their artwork um gets you know everyone can come in and buy their shirts from king of the hammers and we get 15 bucks off of those so. okay so this is on the king of the hammers website correct okay awesome done i'm i'm going to have i'm getting Yay. a shirt yeah because it's, it's not <laughs> cheap <laughs> no it's not racing is very expensive yes. so yeah if you guys can get others and support her let's do it and um sorry glover we ran out of time <laughs>